The second objection had to do with the fact that the cerebrospinal fluid is not all exposed on the outside of the brain. So you can see here, if I were to drill that small hole I was talking about into the outside of the skull, you'd get to an area where there's cerebrospinal fluid. However, there are inner aqueducts where most of the stuff is and it's where it's generated. So the thought, uh, thought was, when I was talking to someone who was a doctor in this sort of thing, was that even if you were able to redes even if hypothetically the amyloid was in equilibrium, you wouldn't be able to establish that chemical gradient because a lot of it would be trapped in the inside of the brain. It wouldn't be able to diffuse outwards to the place where we've drilled a hole in the skull. I think it's clear that wherever there is cerebrospinal fluid, there seems to be more damage. So here are, is a, di like a drawing of a normal brain and Alzheimer's brain. So you can see here on the outside where there's cerebrospinal fluid, there seems to be more damage than the middle part where it's not exposed to cerebrospinal fluid. Also the inside areas, here are the ventricles. So here let me talk, let me show the quick areas. So here you see a three-dimensional picture of the inner aqueduct areas, the ventricles, where most of the cerebrospinal fluid is. And you can see here in these pictures, the area where more cerebrospinal fluid, there seems to be more of these holes forming. Maybe it's not necessarily that it's being, I mean, at least optically, it appears that the area that is most exposed to the cerebrospinal fluid, where supposedly all this amyloid is accumulating, seems to take the most damage. You see these areas in here where they are not directly exposed to large amounts of cerebrospinal fluid don't seem to be as damaged. That may not necessarily be true. It may be less optically obvious, but you can see there, at least visually, there seems to be some kind of correlation. Now perhaps the other areas are taking a lot of damage as well, but that's just what seems to be a striking me visually anyways. But regardless, the whole point was, again, that there's a lot of amyloid accumulating in those areas as well. And it's evident from these pictures, if we go with this cerebrospinal fluid hypothesis, it seems the areas with a lot of cerebrospinal fluid seem to be taking a lot of damage. Again, I've come up with what I believe should be a way to put that kind of concern to rest. I talked to a brain surgeon and asked him if there were any procedures that were done or any any sort of medical procedures where they had to get into the cerebral aqueducts, with this inner area with a lot of cerebrospinal fluid. And he said, yes, in fact, that often in some people there can be too much cerebrospinal fluid in this central area. So in fact what they have to do is drill a hole, get to this aqueduct, and drain out some of the fluid. And I found one article on such thing, such a thing. Aqueduct sten sten stenosis. I can't remember if exactly this was the one he was talking about. He was talking in very general terms that there were times where they needed to operate on people because of something very much like that and needed to get there. So here you can see extracranial shunt. So sturdy tube with a catheter on one drain, the third ventricle. So they've done procedures where they've actually hooked up some catheter to this area to drain spinal fluid out. So my reasoning is that if you can drain it out, you can get a tube in there essentially, and set up this chemical gradient I was talking about. It doesn't matter what the shape of it is, as long as you can get in there and set up this chemical gradient, then you should be okay. So, if that is possible, then this is certainly possible. All we really need to do is get access to the cerebral aqueducts, the cerebrospinal fluid, and 
set it up to where we have the bacteria or enzyme just be able to filter this stuff out. So hypothetically, if we're able to redissolve this amyloid by whatever means we can think of, whether it be through antibodies or breaking them into something else with some drug that causes the pieces that it was broken apart into to become soluble again, then I think it's clear that by this method, we should be able to get into the cerebral aqueduct and filter the stuff out by the, by the means which I had described earlier.